Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to our Shangchung UK lecture series. It's a great pleasure to have Professor David Templeman with us today. He's actually one of the world leading experts on Taranata, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing about David's research. Um, I won't say much more. Uh, after the talk, we'll have some uh, time for questions. So please, if you have any questions, you can write them on the chat or you just keep them for the end of uh, the talk and then David will answer. And thank you. Thank you, David, for joining us. And thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John Young. Pleasure to be with you wherever you are. I'm here and it's cold. Um, and we'll share the screen and we'll go into the slideshow from the beginning. From the beginning. Yeah. So you should now see the first slide, which is the title. I guess that's okay. All right. So um, let me just start by saying that I've been working on Taranatha for many, many years, since the 70s. Um, and my first publication was at that time. And um, I just can't let go of him because he's such an interesting uh, person. I've um, been working for the last 10 years intensively on translating his autobiography, which is a massive work of 800 pages. Uh, I'm nearly, nearly finished. Um, exhaustion or finishing will come first, one of them, I'm not sure. And in it, I have found so much of interest to do with this very awkward period of his life, which encompassed many things, religious, um, um, I guess you could say persecutions of one by another, political changes, the collapse and fall of two dynastic houses of great importance. It was a, a period which I, to quote from myself, um, the 17th century was marked by a constant and vicious struggle between two diametrically opposed forces that represented two visions for a renewed Tibet. Those two forces we'll talk about as we get further into it. In this world of political strife, which was glossed over with a religious overlay, in some cases, there were certain lamas who served secular patrons and became casualties of those patrons' worldly aims. Now, even though we're talking about Tibet, I'm going to take you straight to India and just talk a little bit about Taranatha and his origins. Here's a, a reasonably nice photograph of Taranatha. Um, this is a very important book that he wrote, but I just want to talk about him very, very briefly as a person who ostensibly was very compassionate and loving, but had a very hard side to him at the same time. Here's a, a photograph or an image of him in his mature years. Those mature years were shaped by what happened when he was 16, well, 15 to 16 and 17. Those were the years that I believe shaped him very, very profoundly, as we'll, we'll find out why. If we could uh, move to the next slide. This is uh, Krishnacharya, the primogenitor of his lineage, although there was one before, uh, one figure before, but he was a, rather a mythical figure. Krishnacharya was the beginning of Taranatha's lineage, and there were uh, 13 to 14, depending on how many you count, incarnations before Taranatha was reached. Krishnacharya comes to note, especially because he's the only Siddha out of the 84 who disobeyed his guru openly disobeyed his guru and as a result was unable to attain enlightenment in that lifetime and had to wait till the next incarnation which caused all sorts of complications indeed that same sort of problem comes up before taranatha's birth when taranatha's um, um when when kunga Drichok, who was the incarnation before taranatha died his mother, the person who was chosen to be Taranatha's mother, was too young to bear a child. So the incarnation hovered around for seven years in the body of an Indian prince, prince uh, of, of Tripura. And I've translated and published that little biography, which was written by Taranatha about what he remembered as the young prince of Tripura. And then when his mother's womb was able to bear him, bop, the, the, um, the incarnation entered his mother's womb and Taranatha came into being. 
When he was a young boy, Taranatha spent a lot of time looking out of the windows of his family house. His family house was substantial. His father was descended from the lineage of Ralotsawa, the 11th century um, um, figure, uh, the great yogic figure who introduced the teachings of Vajrabhairava into Tibet. When Taranatha looked out of the window, he, he mentions in his biography, which I should say at the outset was written over many, many years, but he says that he saw Indian yogis such as this. Um, I presume you can all see the whole of the text there. Um, these are typical of the yogis that he would have seen. This is a 17th century Indian picture. But he said when he was about six or seven, he saw them in the grassy area just outside his house and they were doing yoga poses that he was very, very interested in. And at one stage, he went to um, a relative's house to hear a yogi give a sermon when he was about seven and he said i could understand much of what he was speaking which was in an upper Brahmsha, an indian dialect just spontaneously understand what he was saying even though he was told to sit in a corner and mind his own business he kept on edging to the front of the row and kept on listening and he he was able to understand and he said he felt this is this is my life i am sort of in the wrong body here in tibet i feel indian even at a very young age he believed that in his previous incarnations, he had indeed been a yogi in India several times. And as we'll see later on, when his biography, autobiography becomes more fulsome and rich, he actually gives some good examples of that. He felt his true home was India. And whenever he saw Indian, Indian yogis such as this, he felt transported there in the flesh. When he was with these yogis he also probably saw rituals such as this which the indian yogis were in tibet were performing graveyard rituals as they did in india this is an indian example uh, a little bit gory but nevertheless i've had my dinner here i don't know about <laughs> you guys um he saw them and he saw rituals like this and he understood that this was something that that he had experienced at some stage in his earlier life and the Indian yogis who came to him were very, very attracted in, a late, in his later years when he had some, some clout by the fact that he was very generous to them. And so increasingly, as he got older and older, his mon monastery attracted more and more Indians. There were 34 in all who um, came to him over his lifetime and taught him a wide range of things in his early youth uh, after 16, 18 years old. They taught him the Indian epics, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana. They taught him the Sanskrit grammar. He actually translated with one of the Indian pundits the Saraswati Vyakarana, which is the root Indian text on how to read, how to work in Sanskrit. And that's been translated into Tibetan by him, and it's still used. And some of the difficult points of tantric exegesis, which they, as Indian yogis, claim to know the very latest technologies about. That should set people's ears a little bit buzzy because the very latest tantric te techniques in the late 1500s and the si early 1600s. Um, we'll get to that. So here we have Buddha Gupta Natha, Sangi Bebe Gombo. This was Taranatha's teacher. Taranatha was in a meditation retreat at Mahabodhi, not the Mahabodhi in India, but the the site in Tsang, southern Tibet, uh, a mountainous, little mountainous hill on which there were meditation huts called Mahabodhi. And this was his favorite place at 16. He'd been there several times before and engaged in meditation. One day, there was a bit of a fuss at the gateway to the enclave. And this, as he says, naked yogi with flowers in his hair walked into the compound. And this was Taranatha's teacher, Buddha Gupta Natha. This was when Taranatha was 16. He was a monk, Taranatha was, and he capitalized in his later life on the teachings that Buddha Gupta Natha vouchsafed to him. As a result of this, Taranatha became known as Tibet's most preeminent practitioner of rare Indian textual manuals and rituals. Some of these being the latest, I mean, using inverted commas, the latest tantric technologies from India. Buddha Gupta Natha was charismatic and enigmatic. He only stayed for a short time because he really disliked Taranatha's monastic 
obsession with rules and regulations and told him that really he had to get over concepts like good and bad, skillful and unskillful. And he could only stay with him as a result of, uh, of Taranatha's uh, fussiness for a few weeks. But that he said, my t when, you have, when you've sorted yourself out, young boy, my students will come from India and will finish and complete the teachings. When Taranatha described, he wrote a, sh a short biography, which I've translated and it's up for publication soon, of Buddhagupta Natha, based on what he'd heard from Buddhagupta Natha. He says that when he met him, when Buddhagupta Natha sat still, birds would come into his open hands and nest in his hands. And when he fell or jumped from a rock, it was like a sloughed off snake skin. It floated gently, or he floated gently to the ground. It was almost as if there was no gravity for him. He gives wonderful insights into this uh, enigmatic yogi. Now we come to Shantigupta, who was the teacher of Buddhagupta Natha. And you'll wonder where this is going. I said we're going to India for a while, but we'll, we'll get back to Tibet duly. He lived approximately 1500 to 1600. You could adjust those dates accordingly. The only biographical material we have about him comes from Taranatha. And those details were given to Taranatha by Buddhagupta Natha, his teacher. Shantigupta was a great wanderer through Southeast Asia. And while he was in the Southeast Asia, he gathered precious stones and semi-precious stones, almost like a merchant, to bring back to his, his major sponsors in India, who were the Bhagala Rajas of Bandugar. Again, we'll come to Bandugar later. While he was there, he also picked up new slants, new angles on Buddhism, what he claimed were new slants on Buddhism. And I suspect many of these came from Burma and Cambodia, where he wandered to. When he came back, he um, we know we know at the time that he was around, Buddhism really was moribund and almost dead in India. But he was able to cobble together bits and pieces of other Buddhisms that he'd found in Southeast Asia and form new techniques, new, new yogic techniques and new ways of practicing. And he lent a new energy, at least to Taranatha and people who were close to Taranatha, a new energy to a moribund Buddhism. Personally, I don't believe there were any new, serious new technologies of Buddhism available in India or in Southeast Asia. But he certainly brought back some texts and some interesting technologies that Taranatha believed were signs of a live Buddhism somewhere in Southeast Asia. I would say that it wasn't a late remnant of Buddhism at all, but rather a pastiche of well-known and rather attractive newly created materials. But that's just my prejudice. Where, was, where did such yogis in India hang around? Here's the abandoned mosque in Gaur. Gaur was the capital of Beng the Bengal Sultanate between 1450 and 1560, after which it was conquered and completely abandoned, partly because of the conquest and partly because of play. According to Taranatha, through his informants, especially Buddhagupta Natha, it was a luxurious home, this empty palace city, it held 300,000 people in its heyday. It was massive. It's still massive. The ruins are all still there. It became a luxurious home for ascetics of a variety of traditions, Hindu Naths. And you'll notice that Shantigupta gave rise to Buddhagupta Natha and Tara Natha. And the word Nath is a, de designates an, an Indian Hindu practice. Buddhist ascetics, Sufi peers, etc. They all live together in this massive um, series of buildings. They were guaranteed privacy because the plague was still believed to be there. It probably wasn't, but it kept people away, which suited them fine. Both Buddha Gupta Natha and his teacher Shanti Gupta lived in Gaur and used it as a home base, especially Shanti Gupta who, with his trading and spiritual ventures. So now we're going to move to Bandugar, which is the red dot. The capital city of the, the, the kingdom, circled in red, was Rewa. But Bandugar marks something rather special. This was where Shantigupta came with his jewels and traded them to the Raja there. It's very close to Varanasi. On the top of this massive hill, 
this is tiger country, by the way. People go there to this day to see tigers many a day. It's, it's quite wild. On the top of this hill are the ruins and some quite good conditioned buildings, palaces, temples, etc. It was an impregnable hill. And the last two Rajas of interest, the ones who contacted Taranatha, um, were impregnable. And they defied the great emperor of India, Akbar, who wanted things from them. And they said, well, come and get it. And Akbar couldn't get forces to climb that hill. So these two Rajas, cocky fellows, stayed on top of the hill and defied Akbar and did exactly what I'm, I've led up to before. They brought in religious practitioners from a variety of traditions. They themselves are Vaishnava, but they brought in Shiva worshippers. They brought in a whole lot of other people, including Buddhists like Buddhagupta Natha, who was there, and Shantigupta, who was there. It's not only full of charming ruins, but it has a reputation. If you Google Bandugar, it's called the most haunted place in India. And one person has gone to say it's the most haunted place in the world they've ever been to. They're, they're sort of ghost seekers and they say there is nothing like Bandugar. It's terrifying, especially after dark. But you're not allowed to be there after dark. So you have to pull stunts to stay after dark, which this lady did. At some stage or other, there was contact between the Rajas and Taranatha through the person of Buddhagupta Natha, who left this hill fort and went to Tibet and met Taranatha. So word got back and forth. The next picture, th these stupas are in Bandagar, but they were only unearthed in 1982. So Taranatha could not have heard of them. But what he did hear of was the series of caves, which um, date from the time of Ashoka, so 300 odd BC, which scattered around the Bandagar lands and territories, very many of them. The stupas are made of fired clay bricks and are without any doubt a Shokanin period. Whether the caves were pre-Buddhist or not, we don't know. There are no inscriptions or carvings on them. But for Taranatha, who heard of these things, they brought, it, brought to mind the early Buddhist caves of Ajanta and Ellora, which he'd heard about. And for him, this was, wow, people I'm almost in contact with through my teacher might have caves where Buddhists were and maybe still are. And for him, his interest in India was fired up. Just to give you an idea of how sumptuous the palace were, palaces were, the palaces were deserted finally in 1932 by the, the last of the, the Rajas to live there. But Shiva Lingas from the 15th century are still there, just to remind us that they, they worshipped Shiva and they worshipped a whole lot of other people. They brought Kabir there and Kabir's um, Dharmadas, Kabir's greatest uh, follower and promoter, was a part of the community on top of this hill. And to this day, um, there's a festival of two days held every year by Kabir's followers on top of the hill at Bundagar, and 10,000 10, or more followers come. So those are the sorts of people that were there. So we can see now in the bottom inset map in blue where Bundagar was, and in red where Taranatha's territory was. If you look at the larger map, yes, it's separated by Varanasi, the whole of Nepal, and you've got to go 200 miles over the, the Tibet border, but it's not an inconceivable distance. The Rajas of Rewa are extraordinarily rich. You can see the river Son running through their territory. They had over 25 uh, customs posts and taxation posts on that river, which uh, floated produce to Jabalpur, and they made a fortune out of it. When he was 16 and a half, Taranatha received a letter from King Ramachandra, who was staying in Rewa, the town, the main town there at that time. And the letter said, I have heard about you, Taranatha. I've heard that you have Indian teachers that I know. They're my teachers too. I've heard that you are the light of Buddhism in Tibet. You are the only one holding the true Buddhist teachings in Tibet which was a very strange thing to say. Taranatha then wrote, oh, and they enclosed some gold coins and some uh, silks. Taranatha then wrote back to the kings of, of uh, Bhagal 
and said, I've heard of you and I believe that Buddhism is thriving there, that you are holding the last flames of a living Buddhism in India. He created a fantasy land from what he believed from his teachers, but he'd heard of the caves. He knew there were Buddhists there. He believed this was a thriving place. And for 10 years, he really had this vision that there might have been a place for him there. He sensed the civil war, which starts in, in uh, 1603. He sensed the civil war was coming. We'll talk about the civil war in more detail. And I've posited in a couple of papers that it was almost a case of, if you look at the inset map, Taranatha sitting in his mountain fastness, eyeing off Rewa as a bolt hole in case of emergencies somewhere in India. But his relationships with India got him into a little bit of trouble Certain people in the Gelugpa tradition, um, who were very, very highly positioned as teachers of Sanskrit, said, this is an improper sort of relationship. This is not the sort of thing we should be looking at. We should be concentrating on what's happening in our country, not, attract, not spreading our attention down south. So the Civil War starts when Taranatha is 28 in 1603 and extends to 1621. A lot of things happened then. By his 24th year, he was encouraged by his patrons, who were the kings of Tsang, which is the area around where the red dot is, to perform certain rituals. Basically simple, the early, in the early times, simple rituals to aid his patrons in their daily rituals and help them with their spiritual needs. But Taranatha was a restless soul. In his autobiography, as I say, 800 odd pages, he moves consistently Every month he's moving somewhere else. And I put this slide up to show Taranatha um, of interest with Manjushri's sword, erect blue sword on his, his right, looking at the picture, left shoulder. And so he's an incarnation of Manjushri. But the bottom left-hand side of the painting, there he is in a tent. And we have many, many, many dozens of examples of him teaching on the route, en route, so to speak. On the right hand side at the bottom, he's teaching in a structure, a building of some sort, not the big temple that was built for him after the war. And surrounding him at the top are his previous incarnations. So here we can see a fuller picture of him as the incarnation of Manjushri with his sword at his shoulder and on the other shoulder, a flat book of Prajaparamita, the perfection of wisdom. And especially of interest here is I think this is the only example to the left side of his shoulder on the, looking at the picture to the left. There are little meditation huts, which I suspect represent Mahabodhi, the meditation site where his, he met his teacher. So this is, this is him uh, with, again, with his lineage at the top and certain events from his life, preaching only in temples to left and right, but in the middle preaching, as he called Tromon, he gave Tromon, which are bazaar empowerments in the bazaar but sometimes it's referring to a tent he preferred not to enter fortresses where possible of, of patrons except his own patrons other patrons because he didn't know what was going to happen so he preferred to teach out in the open where possible the war comes the civil war and instead of teaching spiritual requirements and such like to his patrons a different set of priorities becomes theirs. By the time he was 28, the war had really just started and he became drawn into performing ceremonies connected with his patrons gaining victory in war. Clearly, this could be considered to be quite contrary to the spirit of Buddhism. Um, but in Taranatha's eyes, the end result of winning such a war would be a stronger Karmakaju religion, a stronger Shangpa religion, and a stronger Jonang religion. He really saw this as being an, an opportunity to strengthen what he saw were the good guys side, as opposed to the Gelukpa, who he had no problem theologically with whatsoever. Despite Jonangpa having a, a view of Shentong, other voidness, that was not an issue ever. He was opposed to their expansiveness. The Gelugpa were pushing westward and pushing eastward into Kham. And he really didn't like that because he'd um, built, he'd actually, by this time, he was about to send his first emissaries of the Jonang tradition to Kham, to Zamtang, to set up a, a series of monasteries in Kham. 
But the Gelugpa were spreading into Kham slowly, and they were certainly spreading westward into Tsang, into this area. So here's an example of what the soldiers of the day would have, would have um, had. So the warfare occurs around in Tsang. Now Tsang in those days was normally, the, we think of it today as the area around Shigatse, but in the time we're talking of, of Taranatha, it extended actually to Lhasa and a little bit beyond. So Tsang was a, a large area. The Gelukpa was strong in Lhasa, despite the presence of non gelupa uh, proselytization there. And there were little arguments back and forth, but nothing too serious until the, the um, coming of the Mongols, which we'll get to in a short while, which strengthened the Gelupa forces immensely. So the rulers that are called the Depar of Tsang ruled between 1565 and 1623, and they were highly mobile, upwardly mobile. And in some people's eyes, the rulers of this massive area of Tsang, which was hugely productive, when, when the Catholic uh, Capuchin monks came in from the West, they said, we've never seen land as fertile as this, and the palaces here are as good as anything in Italy. Um, these rulers were seen by many people as being mere upstarts who'd usurped a role for which they were not particularly well equipped. Um, the story, which is possibly true, um, which I was taught when I was learning Tibetan back in the 70s, was that the Shingshak Doje, who was the first, the primogenitor of this new upstart um, family of rulers, he was the horse, the chief uh, groom for the, all the horses of the, the uh, previous um, um, landowners and, and uh, uh, rulers of the area. And he was the chief landowner, a chief horseman, groom, and he forged a letter in which he asked for 500 um, needles to be given to him. And he took that letter, which was authorized by the, by the ruler, and he put a tiny little um, extra stroke on one letter. So if you know Tibetan, the difference between ka and cha is just one tiny stroke, one stroke, which meant that he wanted, he was authorized for 500 suits of armor, which he then got out of the storeroom with the apparent blessing of the ruler and conquered the ruler. So hence they were seen as upstarts. There were, there were many rulers in, in this lineage, but two of them were rather remarkable. Punsok Namgil and Kama Tenkyong, which I'm going to talk about. Punsok Namgil was measured and reliable, and Kama Tenkyong had some very sound ideas, but was temperamentally unsound as a ruler. This is where they lived in Shigatse, the second so-called second town of Tibet. Both the rulers promoted a new legal code for Tibet. And this was very important because Tibet had so many legal codes, there was no unifying agency between them. And uh, they, felt con oh, they felt confident that they would one day be able to rule through this legal code without any further opposition. And this is the title page of the text of the Tsang legal code. It was based largely on a more ancient legal code and it aimed to restore many of the ancient societal imperial values, which the rulers of Tsang imagined had existed at the imperial time between the mid seventh and late ninth centuries. So this was a, a revanchiste look backwards, looking backwards to the good old days of the seventh to ninth centuries, when there were sound solid rules, when people could walk around unmolested, etc. To authenticate their claims to actually know these values, the Tsang rulers could go back no further than a groomsman. So they invented, and I've written about this in a book, their own family lineage. And they said their own family lineage extended back to the imperial period, which the rules hark back to. So that authenticated, inverted, in inverted commas, their own sense of knowing what those rules were. There were no texts of those rules. They were all orally transmitted, so they had less authority. So this is a picture of Yomowa, Los Ante, uh, uh, Tenzin Nobu. And I highly recommend for your general reading of this period, the book that's uh, on the screen, The Illuminated Life of the Great Yomowa. It's an unbelievably valuable book for this, for understanding this period. So 
about Kama Tenkyong, the temperamentally unsound ruler, the third Yonwatulku, this chap, said of him, quote, he behaves in a manner unwarranted by his family's status. He possesses excessive arrogance regarding his family's lineage. He expects all to perform prostrations before him. He even lacks acts as if he's our own Lama. So Kama Tenkyong was that kind of guy. We have no image of Kama Tenkyong except this one, which comes from an Italian website and which claims that this is Kama Tenkyong. I have not managed to find one anywhere, but let's say this is him. He treated Taranatha with a careless sense of his own superiority. But in Taranatha's large autobiography, even though the ruler's bad temper and sense of entitlement are regularly chronicled, Taranatha does not say a single word against him. It's almost like he's sort of in some sort of uh, fealty or perhaps respect or fear. The lack of criticism might have been due to also to Taranatha's fully internalized sense of his own superiority and his own far more illustrious family lineage. And this is something about which he wrote in his autobiography, but he never used it as a tool of self-aggrandizement. His own family coming from Ralotsawa in the 11th century is unassailable. And as we'll see later on, Taranatha has visions, which he records in his secret autobiography, which is not supposed to be read by non-close disciples, where he was a disciple of the Buddha. Pip that if you can. It's impossible to pip that, but he has other ones that are just as good. In 1608, so five years into the Civil War, Prince of Namgyal, the reasonable ruler, who'd earlier sought some kind of relaxation of tensions with the Gelugpa, made a decision which actually shocked the Gelugpa. This is 1666 a Gruber, who was a missionary in Tibet. Um, he sketched this. I don't think this is the Patala, even though I've, it's, I've called it there an incomplete Patala. I don't think this is, that is the incomplete Patala. Because what uh, Punsok Namgyal did in 1608 was he built a fortress for himself on top of the Potala mountain. You can see the mountain there where the modern Potala is. He built a fortress and stamped it as his own. And what else did he stamp apart from Mount Potala, the, the mountain of Potala? Mount Potalaka is the Southeast Asian mountain, which is the home of Avalokiteshvara, who is the reborn as the Dalai Lama. So he's actually saying about the Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama lineage, this is Mount Potala, but I've built a fortress on it, which didn't endear him to the Geluk. And secondly, it was the site, this hill was the site of Mapuri. It was called Mapuri before it was called Potala, the Red Mountain. And that was the mountain where the early kings lived, Songsengampo, etc between the mid seventh and ninth centuries. So this was an act of fairly brazen one-upmanship. While this was going on though, we have a, a wonderful example of Taranatha meeting other Lamas and not being too involved at this stage with what he became involved in later. Here is the sixth Shama um, and Taranatha talks to him and they have, there's a wonderful section in the autobiography where uh, the Shamar Lama asks Taranatha, well, how do you define the Jonang? And he doesn't talk about Shen Tong. He says the tenets, are, the beliefs, the belief system of the Jonang tenets are that they are everlasting, unchanging, and beyond any sense of partiality. I must say that when Taranatha is asked by his patrons in these early civil war days, although 1622 at this meeting was well into it, near the end. When he's asked to do rituals, he says, I would prefer to do them in a non-sectarian form. I will perform the one day in the Ngor tradition. I will perform another ritual in the, Sha the Shalu tradition. I will do another one in the Shangpa tradition. He didn't preach exclusively, exclusively from a Jonang position. He said that you know this is this the three turnings of the Dharma wheel have just one intention, and that is that it's enlightenment, and all paths lead to enlightenment. Despite this sense that all religious traditions were essentially one in their aims, there was still a sense of enmity amongst the Tsang rulers against the Gelupa. 
And I think the, the enmity was based as much on religious belief as it was on political status. There, were, there, there rose amongst the Gelupa a definite religious hostility. In 1618, Kama Tenkyong had been incredibly rude to the Panchen Lama who was visiting Shigatse. I won't go into the story, but he'd, he'd supplied deliberately only half the, um, the uh, food and requirements for the Panchen Lama. In 1612, Punsop Namgyal, the reasonable ruler, had asked for Gelukpa initiation into the uh, cycle of Amitayas and was refused because he'd been regarded by Geluk monasteries and abbots as being an enemy of the Geluk. What this meant was that what lay behind the per this perception was that Punsop Namgyal had op opposed the search for the rebirth of the fourth Dalai Lama because the those searching for the rebirth were inclined to look towards Mongolia for his rebirth and Prince of Namgyal knew well that if the Mongols came in if, if he was born amongst the Mongols this would bring in not only more uh, Mongol monks and students but would bring in Mongol warriors at the, at the Dalai Lama's behest and that was the core of contention this view of religious traditions being hostile to each other may well have been the case, but it's completely unsupported by what we know of Taranatha and the Kamakagyu tradition of the time from contemporary written materials. Nothing, they have nothing to say between them except kind words about the Gelukpa. This became a political thing. The minds of the Tsang rulers were more, far more hostile. Taranatha actually says in his, in his autobiography, as for the Ngorpa, the Dzongpa, the Shalupa, the Sakyapa, Karmapa, Bodongpa, I have been one of these through all my, my efforts. That means he's actually taught from those traditions. And it's quite, the one he actually favoured more than any was Shalupa and Sakyapa. And he taught for weeks and weeks at a time from the Sakyapa and the Shalupa teachings exclusively. In his secret autobiography, which had remained secret until the Tibetan diaspora of 1959, he reinforces his superiority to his patrons at a time when they're asking him to do some pretty nasty things. He says he was present at some of the Buddha's teachings and even acted as the Buddha's personal confidant. He himself, he claims, was the imperial ruler, Sanam Sinde, in, in the fourth, fifth century of the uh, common era. He was a teacher, the great Jorbojaya's student. He was a Buddhist king of Khotan in Central Asia, etc., etc. He did empowerments. This was one of the things he did. Now, these, this is also taken from Ben Bogan's book of Yomawa. And here's a typical Buddhist empowerment. There's Yomawa in the middle with the crowned hat and putting a stupa on top of the recipient's head to give him... Um, empowerment. So what did Taranatha do for his patrons? He interpreted texts, he translated Sanskrit materials, he commissioned and consecrated artworks, he supervised the Nepalese artisans, he performed rituals which were largely non-sectarian, he managed various death rituals, and I put this in bold for myself, he prevented the effects of black magic curses against his patrons, the rulers of Tsang, and nullified those effects and redirected them back against the Gelupa. So we have ritual warfare involving the invocation of Mahakala, Mahsoma Palden Lama, and the razor, the Lord of the symbols of the Lord of Death. You can see the large greenish gray razor and the smaller one to the left hand side. The wheel of death was last invoked in 1959 by a Sikkimese Lama, I believe, who wanted to dry, use it to drive away the Chinese. He interpreted dreams and omens. He transferred his own tutelary deities to his patrons. So he's now getting in deep, doing ritual warfare. Now, I don't know if you can read all of this because my face seems to be in the way on mine, but as for this, he, he wrote in his biography at this stage, at this very stage when he's deep into... Um, doing things that he possibly didn't want to do, he wrote the very poignant words, as for this very person, the wandering vagabond, vagabond Taranatha, it appears that in the minds of some, I'm held to be both insane and impure. It seems that others say to themselves, oh, isn't he a learned one? And yet when other people speak, they say, oh, he's a stubborn headed logician. And yet others say he's confused. He's become slack. 
Some people say that when they examine the situation, I am indeed one who does not incline towards the tenets of one group or the other. And yet other people say, when they examine the situation, I'm one who's partial to the tenets of one particular group and adhere to those views alone. When some look at me, they see a person whose idle babble splits the Dharma with wickedness and coarseness. And when other people regard me, they see only one who spends his time dwelling in a state of purity and virtue. Some people say I'm just an ordinary sort of person filled with both attachment and an aversion. And yet other people say I'm a fully realized and powerful person. When some speak of me, they say I'm one who possesses a wrong view of the world. When others speak of me, they say I'm one who perceives things as they really are with utmost clarity. When some speak of me, they say I'm, an, I'm just a worldly person with a bad outlook. And others, when they speak of me, say I'm one whose one-pointed focus is always on the Dharma. Some say of me, I'm one who's seen the demonic forces in the flesh. And some people say I've perceived the Buddha himself in the flesh. Some say that I make bad predictions, and some people say my view of the future is good, and they praise me for it. Absolutely all of them fail to agree in what they utter. And as for these many unreliable viewpoints, which are quite extraordinary and foul-smelling, you yourselves will have to decide whether or not they apply to a sleeper by my, like myself. When he was asked on many occasions to give his own opinion, he preferred not to contradict the opinion of his patrons. Here's an example. Taranatha was very, very drawn to the goddess Tara and wrote many, many texts on him. In 1603, at the start of the Civil War, he had a very vivid dream of her. And purely by chance, that morning, somebody came with a very old and very valuable tanka and gave it to him. And he thought, wow, this is amazing. These are signs. As the war started to come closer to him by 1604, he believed strongly that Tara should be able to alleviate any concerns the state might have about the war coming to them. This was not the case. The land and Taranatha blessed the troops just before they engaged in battle with the Mongols who were engaged by the Geluk. The Geluk advances cost Tibet dearly. They lost lands, families who donated to the Tsang cause, they lost income and river crossing taxes. And in a strategy which Taranatha completely failed to raise any criticism against, the firebrand, Kama Tenkyong, firebrand is probably the right word, initiated a scorched earth policy in which he dismantled every fortress and structure which might have aided the Geluk and their Mongol allies, even isolated hermitages and meditation retreat centers, even the Mahabodhi meditation site, which I mentioned before in Sang, where Taranatha had met his guru, that was destroyed. Yet Taranatha didn't utter a word against these acts of defensive vandalism, and he acceded to the policy with, without even the slightest criticism. Excellent. In 1617, he presented the ruler of Tsang with a large biography of the Buddha. It's reputedly the best and most thorough one uh, existent to this day. In return, the ruler gave to Tsang three supports for religion, holy stupa, a holy image, a stupa, and some religious books, which came from the monastery of Abirati in Gyantse, and they were in Sanskrit, so some of the texts were very old. When Taranatha some years later had a monastery built for him by his patrons, the mighty monastery of Takten Ling. One of the temples was that of Abirati, which he built. I haven't got Abirati here, but you can see there are specific temples, Odiana, Sukhavati, Alakava, uh, Shambhala, etc. One of them was built to house these, these um, sacred texts, but the texts had belonged to the ruler of Natang, a principality nearby. They were the king of Natang's personal religious items. And Taranatha knew this was the case because he'd been on very good terms with that, that ruler and had performed rituals for him for years. And yet he was given these booty items on the condition he installed them in a newly constructed temple in Tukten Ling, which temple, as I mentioned, was given by, to him by his, by his patrons. It was almost as if the construction of the monastery was in part a sort of payoff to Taranatha for the effectiveness or otherwise of his various blessings. Taranatha said not a word to anyone about the legitimacy of handling these items and duly installed them where he'd been told. Tukten Ling today is 
beautiful beautiful ruins although there are so you can see at the bottom some recent restructures but basically the, it was totally demolished in the cultural revolution as Taranatha drew, drew closer to his um eventual passing and here's a picture of him in Mongolia a, a statue made by Zanabaza of Taranatha as an older man he becomes highly critical of people which he hadn't been up to now in his autobiography including lamas and his tone became point and abrasive no longer content to make the usual general criticisms where he made them he becomes earthy and pointed in tone and uses similes and language that he might well have picked up as a child i mention that because throughout his autobiography he floats over things which he experienced which clear, clearly irked him and he was gently critical of these things but in later life he becomes quite pointed and had little time for such nastiness, uh, for such niceties. So in his last years, he says things like, and I'm quoting from his autobiography, it's said that the, the study of both grammar and logic to its endpoints leads one directly to Mahamudra. Huh. As for your claims about such things concerning the Mahamudra, if they're so, then what you've claimed is like trying to make a golden image out of dog droppings through the application of sheer effort. And he says again, Right now, I've reached the end of my time. I found making distinctions such as one's own point of view and that of others, differentiating between layman and monk, superior, inferior, male, female, being religious or being secular. For the most part, making such distinctions is like grasping hold of dro dog droppings and mistaking it for gold. How unbelievable. I regard Taranatha in part only as a manipulator of the relationship that he had with his patrons, but we mustn't regard this as necessarily being an aberrant feature of Buddhism. It's precisely what rulers throughout time in India and Tibet and other places have done. You capture your enemy's totems. Here I'm referring back to the books, the sacred books from Natang, and you gain an undisputed control, not over their deities, but over the secular powers as well. And I think Taranatha was involved in that, in this particular case. The ending. I'll do the last the last ten minutes. Um, One moment. Have I got ten minutes? Five. Yep. Okay. The fifth Dalai Lama. The fifth Dalai, the fifth Dalai Lama's forces eventually defeat the Tsangpa completely. Although Taranatha claimed to be completely non-sectarian and deeply respectful to the Gelug tradition over time, he became estranged from the aspects of Gelug power as they expanded, as I mentioned before, into Eastern Tibet and right into, into uh, Tsang. The mutual dislike towards Taranatha held by the fifth Dalai Lama culminated in his conversion, the fifth Dalai Lama's conversion and partial destruction of the great Tukten monastery after the death of Taranatha in 1634. There are two slides I'm going to show now which involve me. At this stage, I, I was very interested in why Taranatha didn't like the fifth Dalai Lama and why the fifth Dalai Lama had such personal animosity towards Taranatha. In this next slide, I am standing looking very hostile to Jean Smith, the most wonderful scholar of all time. No need to point to me. <laughs> I'm looking hostile. I'm the only hostile one there. Gene has just told me that a possible reason that he had discovered in the earliest recension of the fifth Dalai Lama's Namtar uh, biography, autobiography um, was that the Dalai Lama suspected that his mother was Taranatha's consort who Taranatha had impregnated. So we're getting into Freudian stuff or Jungian stuff here. Um, whether this was true or not, I was absolutely gobsmacked when I heard it. But as Gene kept on explaining it, and thank goodness somebody took these pictures. I came, yeah, I said, I'm going to chase these texts up, which I have, but I haven't yet translated them. So I'm I'm still looking for those particular lines. But were to, was Taranatha to have been the father of the fifth Dalai Lama, that puts us a new slant on things. Of interest was the discovered 20 years ago the so-called it's not but the so-called secret library of, of the fifth Dalai Lama which was evidently in a hidden part of the Potala in which there were many thousands of documents and I've gone through this Karchak in two volumes this uh, summation of of what texts there were and there were over 250 of Taranatha's texts there including some of the ones 
that uh, Tara and Arthur um, valued highly and which would have probably upset the, um, the fifth Dalai Lama. So after the death of Tara and Arthur, he's too hot to have a rebirth. He's been reborn so many times, but he's too hot to handle for a rebirth in the central part of Tibet. So he's reborn as Zanabadza, one year, 1635, one year after Taranatha's death in Mongolia. This was finagled, to use a, an Irish word, by the Panchen Lama and the fifth Dalai Lama, um, the fourth Panchen and the fifth Dalai Lama. As a, it was a safe offshore berth for Taranatha after the troubles of Tibet's civil war. And it's better to get rid of rebirths that were too directly involved in the so-called anti-Gelukpa stance, get them somewhere else amongst the Mongols. But in his autobiography, which I've worked through quite carefully, Zanabaza says, I do not feel that I'm the genuine rebirth. It's other people who have, posit have pushed me into this position. So even Zanabaza himself wasn't quite convinced. Just on the side, if you look up his name and Google his bronze images, they are the most superb, brilliant, brilliant images. So the Zanabaza lineage keeps going. So it, it's sort of like Taranatha at a distance, right the way through until the final eighth, the Bog Gegen, who died in 1924. As a young man here, one of the, these were pressed in Russia, I believe, um, hand painted around the outside, but the central image is 3D pressed on tin and they're very common. You can still find them in bazaars in Mongolia. He was a very uh, pressured individual and he asked for this flag, this prayer flag to be flown on every tent and every um, house in Mongolia to avert strife. Um, accusations were made against him by the 13th Dalai Lama that he, this last incarnation was a, a profligate, a womanizer, etc. These, I think, were based on the accusations made by the Russian uh, minister to Mongolia in the 1890s, who wrote several volumes on how what a, what a nasty person this incarnation was. But he's held even this, this eighth incarnation in Mongolia today as being a paramount virtuous monk. So the, the 13th Dalai Lama said he was not allowed to, re, to be reborn. The flag flew and the flag to, uh, to avert catastrophe the catastrophe he predicts in this flag and there are lines in here that rivers ankle deep of blood will flow through mongolia when the communists come and he was pretty well right because by 1934 10 years after his death there were no monasteries left in mongolia but in fact he did take a rebirth this last one did take a rebirth in 1933 and he passed away in india in 2012 and the circle we come full circle the 14th Dalai Lama recognized him as the legitimate rebirth of Taranatha. So a suitable place to end. We've come from beginning right to his rebirth. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, David. Very fascinating thank overview. Very interesting to hear. I can't um, hear you. Can you hear me now? No here, no talk. That's strange. Can you can you hear? I can hear you. Yes. No. Yes. I'm, okay. Now I can. Okay. Good. Wobbly connection. Yeah. Thank you so much. And if anybody has questions, please you can either raise a hand in the chat or you can just unmute yourselves directly. So, David, actually, I think uh, the reincarnation in Dharamsala back in 2012, you just said there was a Mongolian connection. Wasn't he born yes, in yes, Mongolia? Yes, he, he was born in Mongolia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on that steep house down the hill called Takten House or something, yeah. right? Yeah, And there's been no reincarnation since then. Has there been any talk of a future reincarnation? I haven't heard, but I'm not, I'm not in the loop. But there, I'm sure there will be. Uh, Interesting. I hope there will be. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any questions from the chat? Let's see. Don't see any. 
And could you tell us some more about, you said about his uh, interest in Tara and he, 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 he did some works on the origins of the Tara Tantra, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was the first book I translated. And um, the story behind that is horrendous. I, I submitted a draft of my translation in about 1971 or two or three to the Library of Tibetan Works. And I said, is this the sort of thing you might be interested in? Um, I'm just a beginner in Taranatha. And they said, yeah, absolutely. So I spent another two years um, perfecting it and they published the first draft. <laughs> it all came back to bite me. I've had so much flack for that book, but it still works. Anyway, um, he very was a very strong believer in Tara. Um, he, he wrote sadhanas. He wrote very many uh, mandala cre creations of her. He wrote the origin of her tantra. And in that book, um, The uh, Origin of the Tara Tantra, he gives a lot of information that came to him from Indian yogis about Tara and the position that Tara was in, in places like Bodhgaya. So stories that had never been, he says, had never been heard in Tibet before. He heard from Indian yogis who wandered in the Tara of the water spout. That story had never been in India before. Uh, an, um, a Hinayanist monk in Bodhgaya is frightened of some robbers who are coming and he goes to the the water spout where Tara is in there's a little sort of a little pipe coming out and he says oh save me save me Tara and she says yeah you ask me now when you're in trouble you didn't ask me for anything before she says hop in so he squeezes himself into the water spout and is saved those stories were new to Tibet in Taranatha's time and they came from India and he collected everything he could about Tara and incorporated most of it into the, the book that was translated as the origin of the Tara Tantra, the Jets and Dream of Yugi Junkul. So you're a, a strong believer. And as far as you read or saw when you were talking about all these sort of skillful means for war and so forth, would he have been using the fierce Tara sort of pujas and no, and no. all that? Was there any no, he doesn't actually specify. He doesn't specify what he did. He just says that he was asked to bless the troops. He was asked to invoke Mahakala, Padin Lamo, etc. He doesn't talk about Tara. A question's come up saying, how can we read the final version? Um, it really is the version that's come out in the last two editions, the latest edition and the one before it. They're, they're the upgraded versions. The first one with the blue cover, burn it. <laughs> so any of the later vision, versions with um, uh, fawn colored, rather sort of buff colored covers, they're the ones, they're good. Yep, yeah. all over there somewhere. I can show you a copy just to show you which one to look for. My wife's just whizzing off to get the uh, the copy. No, no, above, above, above to the right, to the right. One of those slim ones. Okay, sorry. Next question. Yep. This is what it looks like. Oh yeah. Can you see it? Yeah. That's the latest. That's the latest version. And currently, you're working on another publication. You said you're working on a major work, correct? The the autobiography. The autobiography, okay. The autobiography. What stage, what stage are you at? I'm 91.3% through it. I'm now so obsessed <laughs> that I, <laughs> I calculate at the end of every day, oh God, am I getting closer to the end? 91.3%. Another few months. I've, right. I've done it. I've done it once before. I just, I'm checking it. It's nitpicking. The Life of Buddha Gupta Natha will come out with another life of Krishnacharya. The, you saw the second or second slide was one of... Krishnacharya, the book that was published in the 80s. There's another life of Krishnacharya written by um, Kunga Drachok, who was Taranatha's um, incarnation, but one pre-incarnation. That one will be coming out also. So there'll be those two small ones, relatively small. Just out of curiosity, um, in one of your slideshows, you were saying how one of the gurus was uh, bringing uh, precious gems back from Southeast Asia, yeah. trading them. That's interesting because a while back they gave me a book about um, precious stones and their uses and that the Buddhist view of sort of gem traders and dealers was always low because they were mm -hmm. considered sort of scammers who would go around the kings yeah. trying to 
where the Hindus really respected them as sort of, yeah. and I think the very word was mandap or mandi or something at mm -hmm. the center of the mandala. Yeah. So I was curious to see about a Buddhist master who was engaged in this gem trade. Well, if you, if you really look very, very deeply into these Buddha Gupta Natha and Shanti Gupta, his teacher, and some of their cohorts, you have to question how Buddhist they were. And I've looked through some of the texts written by Shanti Gupta, and I've translated a couple, and there's nothing new in them. There's a new slant, but there's no textual, nothing new that's textual in them. So I presented a paper on this at one of the International Association of Tibetan Studies conferences. I think they were actually bringing out older stuff that was being paraded as being the latest technologies for a young Taranatha who they knew they could get a month's free board and lodging and great food from. And they were just wandering yogis who played their cards very well. And there are lots of examples of that in the autobiography and elsewhere. Mm -mm -mm -mm. And tra gem trading was why not? Yeah. So it sounded like politics and worldly affairs. Taranatha, did he have much time to go off on long personal retreats or dedicate himself to sort of more simple pure dharma? Or was he always involved in sort of political machination? It's, it's amazing. When I'm reading this autobiography, I would say that 65% of the time he's preaching and teaching to other people and 30 percent of the time he's in retreat but sometimes he's called out of retreat and i didn't think that was possible but he's saying i'm going for a a long retreat i'm tired i'm exhausted and yet one of his patrons will say i want you here to transfer my grandfather's uh, tutelary deities or my tutelary deities to my grandfather who's very ill and taranatha comes out of his retreat many many i'd say 20 times in the autobiography he's he's reefed out of a retreat because he's needed by his patrons i would have imagined that any of the great lamas would have said no i'm not moving but he did he moved he doesn't refuse he gets very stroppy and says i i, I did what i could and then i wanted to go back into retreat but very often he's called somewhere else he's at the beck and call of princesses of queens of every petty ruler in the area and he's constantly on the move and i think that's why he's got that sobriquet the wanderer Yakamba. i think we have a question in the chat. i have translated the secret autobiography and i'm not going to publish it um it's not intended for um non-initiates uh if you're a tibetan reader you can read it yourself it's there in tibetan text but it's not the sort of thing i feel confident that i want to um put out but i will draw on it and i have drawn on it in my phd thesis which i did as a retirement project 10 years or whatever it was 15 years ago i drew on it for that and i will inform the translation of the autobiography where there are interesting things in it and there are things that are um interesting culturally as well as being secret tantric practice for instance, he in his in his secret, and I'm not giving any secrets away. He is asked to do a series of worships of a deity in Kasha on the Indo-Tibetan borderlands, and if he does this, it will bring great benefit to him and to his region. He says, "But as a lazy sort of fellow, I thought about it for a while, but I never went, so I never got those benefits." Eh, he's sort of easy come, easy go in that. That's in his secret autobiography, but that's the one thing I can tell you. Um, most of it is fairly not available. And there's also a Yang Sangwe Nanta, a super secret autobiography, which was not intended to be seen or read by anyone. It was buried in his tomb with him. And it was cracked open in the Cultural Revolution and it came out. More than that, I won't say. A secret within a secret. Indeed. A super yeah. secret. Young somewhere. Super secret. There's a question. If you've seen the obvious, super secret. Uh, obvious question. It is an obvious question. And the answer is. Yes, you won't answer it. <laughs> for 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, David, if we have no more questions, then I'd love to thank you on behalf of all of us. And thank you. Really fascinating. Great overview. And uh, Pleasure.
of luck with your remaining 8.7% of your... Uh, <laughs> You're good at maths. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we, we will be happy to welcome you back when you've done your uh, future publication if you want to tell us more about it. And thank I'll you. I'll send you a copy. Thank you so much. <laughs>